In our last analysis, we explored various concepts concerning assimilating the total self. In the second part of this series, we shall discuss the crude elements of the personality that must be refined to derive the true self. The goal of these discussions is to broaden our understanding of the psyche to assist us on our journey of self-mastery since the ingredients of selfhood must be identified and acquainted before proper integration can be commenced. But despite many of these ideas being established in mainstream circles, I advise that an enlightened understanding be used in adjusting the context of these videos. With that said, let us examine the concepts of the ego, the shadow, and the self. Carl Jung described the ego as the complex factor to which all conscious contents are related. That is to say, it is the principle of interpretation for all conscious activities and forms the criterion for consciousness. The ego is only part of the personality and is regarded as the center of consciousness. The ego personality, on the other hand, is the behavioral mask we wear. It could contradict or amplify the self depending on the level of individuality. As an interface, the ego personality is the veil to the inner realm which modulates conscious perceptions but does very little to mediate inner opposites. Consequently, the environment significantly shapes the predispositions of the ego personality since it is the weakest buffer of perception. The self as an extension of the ego is the totality of the personality which includes all content that cannot be fully understood. It represents the tension of all tangible and latent facilities of the psyche while its supraordinate principle, denoted as wholeness, is the paradoxical equilibrium of these faculties. Dr. Jung expressed the phenomenology of the symbols of wholeness as follows. Although wholeness seems at first to be nothing but an abstract idea, it is nevertheless empirical insofar as it is anticipated by the psyche in the form of spontaneous or autonomous symbols. These are the quaternity of Mandela symbols which occur not only in dreams of modern people who have never heard of them but are widely disseminated in the historical records of many peoples and many epochs. Their significance as symbols of unity and totality is amply confirmed by history as well as by empirical psychology. Unity and totality stand at the highest principle on the scale of objective values because their symbols can no longer be distinguished from the Imago Dei. Hence, all statements about the God image apply also to the empirical symbols of totality. This declaration presents a dilemma to modern post-Christian thinking where intellectualism has diminished the notion of divine congruity as it manifests in man. Well, wholeness is as much a psychic reality as it is a philosophical thought food. As a spontaneous occurrence in dreams, it engenders a numinous intensity which can best be described as a prefiguration of the archetypal light. And as we know, light displaces darkness, and for our context, not just the darkness of ignorance, but also the possessive precipitations of the shadow. Continuing with this motif, the supraordinate self, the personification of wholeness, may be pictured as a regal figure which rules the unconscious mind. Thus, the goal of the individuation process is the assimilation of personal and collective archetypal facts allowing the dislocation of the center of consciousness from the ego to the self. Notwithstanding, individuation does require some confrontation with insanity, which is why the integrity of the ego personality must be maintained as much as possible during the process. Let us now discuss a less glamorous portion of the personality, the shadow. The shadow is the negative side of the personality, which Jung described as follows. A shadow is a moral problem that challenges the whole ego personality, for no one can become conscious of the shadow without
without considerable moral effort. To become conscious of it involves recognizing the dark aspects of the personality as present and real. Closer examination of the dark characteristics, that is, the inferiorities constituting the shadow, reveals that they have an emotional nature, a kind of autonomy, and accordingly, an obsessive, or better, possessive quality. Emotional disturbances occur usually where adaptation is weakest, and at the same time, they reveal the reason for its weakness, namely, a certain degree of inferiority and the existence of a lower level of personality. On this lower level, with its uncontrollable or scarcely controlled emotions, one behaves more or less like a primitive who is not only the passive victim of his affects, but also singularly incapable of moral judgment. While the personal shadow represents unconscious inferiorities as it pertains to the ego personality, the archetypal shadow is an embodiment of absolute evil and tyranny. Moreover, the personal shadow can be assimilated into the conscious personality without much difficulty where its influence is best detected as projections. Jung classified the nature of projections in these statements. Let us suppose that a certain individual shows no inclination whatever to recognize his projections. The projection-making factor then has a free hand and can realize its object if it has one, or bring about some other situation characteristic of its power. As we know, it is not the conscious subject but the unconscious which does the projecting ends. One meets with projections, one does not make them. The effect of projection is to isolate the subject from his environment, since instead of a real relation to it, there is now only an illusory one. Projections change the world into the replica of one's own unknown face. On a lower level, the shadow complements the ego, and while its content are typically projected, it is not responsible for projection. So what is this projection-making factor? They are the animal in man and the animals in women, concretized as the CCG. Their concept is a bit abstract, but I feel it is best to picture them as inverted emotional flavors of the unconscious of the sexes that create binding illusions among other functions. In men, it is the feminine principle entombed by partial identity with the mother imago, while in women, it is a masculine principle which can be abstracted as substrate of the father complex. They form the texture of the unconscious of both genders and supplant ideas that coordinate emotions. This conforms to our understanding of the unconscious as a matrix and its world spinning, illusion creating and projection engine is the anima. Its most isolated effect is in dreams where it spawns as an unknown but familiar personification of the opposite sex and displays obstinate characteristics of the gender. Though the anima is closely related to the mother imago, its influence exceeds this classic allegory and also features the sister and spouse imago in a supernatural sphere. Thus, a thorough picture of this archetype is hard to describe, but the following statement gives a better illustration. The autonomy of the collective unconscious expresses itself in the figures of the anima and the animus. They personify those of its content, which when withdrawn from projection, can be integrated into consciousness. To this extent, both figures represent functions which filter the contents of the collective unconscious through to the conscious mind. They appear or behave as such, however, only so long as the tendencies of the conscious and the unconscious do not diverge too greatly. The reasons for their behaving in this way is that though the contents of the anima and animals can be integrated, they themselves cannot since they are archetypes. As such, they are the foundation stones of the psychic structure which in its totality exceeds the limits of consciousness and therefore can never become the object of direct cognition. What we can discover about them from the conscious side is so slight as to be almost imperceptible. It is only when we throw light into the dark depths of the psyche and explore the strange and torturous parts of human fate 
that it gradually becomes clear to us how immense is the influence wielded by these two factors that complement our conscious life. This passage is remarkable for several reasons. It reminds us that there is a limit to cognitive self-knowledge, after which a bridge of intuition must be relied upon. It also tells us that the conjunction of the conscious mind with the unconscious is the prerequisite for integrating the treasures of the collective unconscious. And in integrating these treasures to waking consciousness, a contentment with the paradoxical framework of the psyche is recommended. For if we try to impose mortal expectations on our findings, we will meet impossible bottlenecks and even miss the point of the entire exercise. But as long as the ego personality remains oblivious to the subtle influences of the shadow and on the deeper level, the anima, such progress cannot even be made in the first place. In our next video, we shall look at the symbols and manifestations of the self. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.